In this video, I'm going to show you how to design a restriction digest to identify whether you've cloned a gene correctly into a vector. To do this, you'll need this free program, a plasmid editor. You can get that by Googling a plasmid editor or typing in this URL. Here, the next thing that you'll have to do is you'll have to make a, a an expected DNA file. I've already done this here where we have this gene SNAP33 cloned into the PMDC83 vector. What I mean by you'll have to make an expected um, DNA file is you will be able to download the sequence of this vector or any vector and here, SNAP33 has been inserted into this vector um, by gateway cloning. And it's shown right here. This DNA file is um, color coded with different features. We can see all the features by going to List Features. And you can see here that it has 2 times 35S promoter, um, a NOS terminator, um, and an MGFP, and of course our SNAP33 gene. If we click on any of these features, they'll all get highlighted, right? So we can see the promoter, there's the promoter, there's the terminator, um, there's GFP. Anyway, so after we've pasted in our sequence of SNAP33, then we want to we want to design a restriction digest that will help us identify whether our cloning strategy worked and we have the the right web vector. To do this, we'll unselect everything and we'll go to uh, enzymes, and we'll say view um, uh, graphic map plus unique enzyme cutting sites. And here we get another map of the circular PMDC83 vector with SNAP33 in it. And right here, this, this little green area here, that's our SNAP33. Again, if I click it, you'll see that the sequence behind there gets highlighted. And you'll also notice there's a number of restriction sites um, that are um, labeled on this circular map. So in order, to, in order to get a meaningful restriction digest, we could use a whole lot of different possible enzymes, but one of the easy ways to do, do it is to just pick enzymes that cut on the um, outside of, your, of the piece of DNA that you inserted in there. And then the second rule, the second rule is that when possible, use the more common um, heavily used enzymes because they're more likely to be in your lab. They're often cheaper and they often do a much better job of cutting. Um, they're, you know, they can be more stable over a longer time period. Here anyway, we can see that on one end of our SNAP33, we have at least three different enzymes here um, that appear to be um, on the edge um, or on, on one side of the SNAP33, like before the beginning. And we can, we can get a, a better idea whether where exactly they are by double-clicking this. If I double-click BAMH1, for example, now the cursor on this um, uh, sequence editor is exactly where that uh, cut site is. We can see this GGATCC. So we can see that that enzyme is going to cut um, on one end of our SNAP33. We go back to uh, this map and we can try to find a, something that cuts on the other side of it. And we have a lot of choices here it looks like. It looks like anything past the, past the green arrow we could use. Um, so we have all of, all of these different enzymes here. Now, uh, NCO1 is a fairly common enzyme. Um, not all of these are really common enzymes. And then right here we have um, past the GFP, 
we have an echo R1 site. Echo R1 is, of course, a really, really common enzyme, and pretty much every lab has that. So we could we could probably do a diagnostic um, cut of our vector with BAM H1 and echo R1, and that would cut out this everything in between this piece of T, um, everything in between here. So let's do that. Let's see what would happen. Let was, let's see what ha would happen if we ran a gel with this cor with the correct vector cut with BAM H1 and ECHO R1. So now we can go to enzymes again and go to enzyme selector. And here we have a list of you know the commonly used enzymes in this enzyme file. Um, and let's select BAM H1. And let's select ECHO R1. You can see they're both labeled that they only cut once. You'll notice there's other enzymes that cut multiple times, like this cuts four times. And then we'll just say digest. And so here, here's what we get. We get uh, we'll get two bands. We'll get one band that will be 9,734 base pairs, and we'll get another band that will be. 2010 base pairs and if we run um, a gel with a 1 kb plus ladder um, this is what our gel would look like and so this could be a, a diagnostic way to figure out whether we've correctly cloned um, snap 33 into pmdc 83 if we don't get this band pattern then we probably then we probably don't have the correct clone anyway next i'll show you to um, how to make a master mix, how to set up a master mix so we can uh, check a number of different clones or a number of different pieces, a uh, number of it, different DNAs um, with, a, with ECHO R1 and BAM H1. Now that we know we want to use BAM H1 and ECHO R1 um, to analyze our plasma DNA, we have to set up the actual digest. The actual digest will have a number of different components. It'll have water. It'll have 10x green buffer, 10x fast digest green buffer. You can have other buffers as well, but I highly recommend, when possible, you use 10x fast digest green buffer because it simplifies things. All and basically any enzyme that um, that they sell as a fast digest enzyme will work in this 10x fast digest buffer, and it's green and it has a density agent that will let you load it right on a gel and then you won't have to think very hard will my enzyme work in this buffer or will these two enzymes both work in this buffer so it's compatible across a whole lot of different buffers and then of course we're going to add BAM H1 and ECHO R1 to fill out this reaction here for analytical digest it's desirable to do a 5 microliter digest because that will save on our plasmid and on our restriction enzymes and is more than sufficient for loading on a, a mini gel system. Now what is really, what is really common is to, do, to make a master mix uh, for restriction digests where you would make a master mix that would di um, be able, help you to digest you know, several different plasmids. So you might, let's say we want to check six different DNAs, whether they all, um, how BAM H1 and ECHO R1 cut each one of them. On this calculator, we can change any of these things here. So we could change the number of reactions to six, and it will calculate our master mix here for us. We could change the reaction volume, we could change the plasma volume, and we could change whether we have one or two enzymes as well. For most high copy plasmids, one microliter of plasma volume is going to be en plenty enough to see nice bands on your gel. In some cases, if you work with a binary lower lower copy binary vector, you may want to put two microliters of uh, plasma DNA. And if you were using this for something other than analytical purposes, you could certainly set up bigger than five microliter reactions. Now one one point that I need to make is that when if we wanted to make a master mix for setting up six reactions, we would actually probably want to set up a, um, a mix for maybe six and a half reactions. So that when we pipette um, 
four microliters of this mix into each of our tubes. We don't run out at, um, of, of mix it by the sixth tube, or maybe we might be one or two microliters short if we, if we, um, if we set this up for exactly six, micro, um, six reactions. All right, now that we know what we're going to uh, pipette, I'm gonna, next I'm going to show you on the bench um, how to actually set up this master mix and how to digest our DNA. All right, now let's set up our restriction digest. You should add the master mix in the order uh, down on the sheet, so we'll add water first. Followed by a green buffer. The fast digest buffer is highly recommended because it makes uh, picking the right buffer for the enzymes very easy as long as the enzymes are compatible with um, the fast digest system uh, to work in this buffer. And also, as you can see, the reason it's called green buffer is that it's green and it has a density agent that will uh, help the DNA to sink into the wells of a gel without you having to add the enzyme. I'm going to bring the enzymes. They're kept at minus 20. When possible, you should use a freezer rack like this to keep the enzymes cold when they're out of the freezer. You want to keep the enzymes as cold as possible, uh, minus 20 at all times to uh, prolong their activity. When stored properly, enzymes can last up to 10 years past their expiration date. You also want to use the smaller pipette, the, the pipette, the 10 microliter pipettes. Tips because they're much skinnier and will have less enzymes sticking on the outside of them since the enzymes have glycerol. That's our echo L1. Now our BAM H1. I'm going to pipe it up and down several times get that small amount of enzyme out of the tip since it is vis thick and viscous. And then we want to get these enzymes back into the minus 20 immediately. Now I'm going to briefly mix this um, master mix by uh, vortexing on speed 5, about halfway in the vortexer. Now we're going to distribute that master mix to our six pre-labeled tubes. And pipetting solutions that have detergent or protein or other viscous or sticky, um, sticky agents in them can be a little bit different than pipetting plain water. So in order to distribute four microliters equally to all of these six tubes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pipette a little bit of our mix out one time and I'm going to pipette it back to the first stop and I'm going to have just the tiniest amount of enzyme uh, master mix left in the tip. And I'm going to get my four microliters out again. I'm going to go to my first tube. And I pipe in the four microliters to the first stop only. And I repeat this. This is the best way to get um, very close to four microliters master mix into each one of these tubes using a single pipette tip.
it's important also not to touch the inside of the tube or the inside of the cap with your fingers because they might have some DNA cysts or other contaminants that may mess up or interfere with this assay. So now that four microliters are in each one of these tubes, now we just need to add our DNA. And I have these six mini prep DNAs that are lined up here. They're lined up, up uh, with the corresponding tube, digest tube. Get one microliter out of that. I'm going to place my plasma DNA and my restriction digest in a new row to help me to keep track of where I'm working. Also, when I'm adding the DNA to the master mix, I'm pipetting up and down a few times to get a little bit of mixing happening. Six, um, six different digests. You could do 10, 20, even. Get minimal effort. Now that those are all assembled, we just need to mix them by vortexing. Set our vortex on half speed, so about five. I'm just going to give it a little, a little buzz so that uh, you see the DNA and the digest mixing. See the swirling action. It's always important to mix your DNA. Uh, it's basically important to mix any solution. Otherwise, if the enzymes are not touching the, actually touching the DNA, they can't digest it. Now we'll put these at 37 degrees, uh, and then we'll run a gel, and the DNA will be digested. Thank you for watching.